open up your own paperwork on this. Is that correct? Yeah, that's in progress. And uh, CCME and uh, SPDI copy, no constraints. You'll go for launch in this configuration, correct? That's correct. SPS, go. And I copy all. Thank you. And all personnel, discontinue all non-mandatory LDB traffic for remainder of the countdown. NTD Houston Flight. Go ahead, Houston Flight. I can give you step 1047, BFS pre-flight, uplink load is complete. And I copy that in CBFS, you copy? CBFS copy. We're now at T minus nine minutes and holding here, then a hold that is supposed to last about 45 minutes. Once Endeavour clears the tower, command and control of STS-126 switches to the Mission Control Center in Houston. At this time, we'll go there for an update with Kelly Humphreys. This is Mission Control Houston at the T minus nine minutes and holding mark. Flight controllers belonging to the ascent team have been on control since here about 1 o'clock this afternoon, monitoring Endeavour systems in preparation for the fourth shuttle launch of the year. The ascent team is led by Flight Director Brian Lunney with the assistance of astronaut Alan Poindexter, who's the spacecraft communicator, or CAPCOM. Poindexter will be talking directly to the crew during Endeavour's eight-and-a-half-minute ride to orbit. They're joined on console by Flight Director Richard Jones and astronauts Greg Johnson and George Zamka, who are monitoring weather conditions at Kennedy Space Center. Point Dexter and Johnson are in direct contact with astronaut Steve Lindsay, who is flying the shuttle training aircraft around the vicinity of the shuttle landing strip at the Cape. Among other things, he's assessing today's uh, weather conditions, but at the moment, uh, everything is within the handling capabilities uh, in the event of a return to launch site aboard. At the time of Endeavour's launch, the International Space Station will be orbiting 212 statute miles above the South Pacific. Endeavour's launch is timed to match the moment when the Earth's rotation carries launch pad 39A into the corridor or plane of the station orbit. Endeavour's launch window opens at uh, precisely 6.55.39 seconds p.m. Central Time and lasts 4 minutes 39 seconds until 7 p.m. and 18 seconds. Down the hall from the shuttle flight control room, another team of flight controllers is on duty in the International Space Station flight control room, led by Flight Director Royce Renfrew as they watch over the activities of the Expedition 18 crew aboard the space station. Commander Mike Fink, NASA Flight Engineer and Science Officer Greg Shamatov, and Russian Flight Engineer Yuri Lanchikov have been preparing for Endeavour's arrival for the past month. Shamatov has been aboard the station for 168 days following his launch aboard the shuttle Discovery in May. Fink and Lanchikov are in their 34th day in space since their launch October 12th in a Soyuz rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. They arrived on the station on October the 14th to begin their half year on the complex. This was a light duty day for the station crew with periodic fitness checks, experiment activities, and final airlock preparations for the four spacewalks planned on STS-126. They also watched the Progress 30 cargo ship undock from the Zvezda service module's aft port at 10.20 a.m. Central Time today. Station crew is expected to watch this evening's launch on a television uplink from Mission Control. Shuttle flight controllers here in Houston also are watching weather conditions at the overseas abort sites in Spain and France, which would be used in the event of an engine failure early in Endeavour's climb to orbit. Zergos of Spain is considered the prime transoceanic abort site today for Endeavour and its crew. Current forecast calls for go conditions at all three European sites. At launch, Endeavour will be sent aloft on the collective power of its three liquid-fueled main engines and its twin solid rocket boosters, combining for a total of 7 million pounds of thrust. About 30 seconds into the flight, following its roll maneuver, Endeavour's computers will throttle the main engines down to 72% or rated performance to lessen the aerodynamic forces on the shuttle's external fuel tank and the orbiter's aerosurfaces. Shortly after solid rocket booster separation, Endeavour's orbital maneuvering system engines will ignite for about a minute and 43 seconds, providing an assist for the shuttle as it heads uphill. 
A little less than six minutes into the flight, Endeavour's onboard computers will command the shuttle's main engines to swivel, allowing Endeavour to roll to a heads-up position above its modified external fuel tank during the ascent. That maneuver will allow Endeavour to gain more favorable communications with the tracking and data relay satellite system. About eight and a half minutes after launch, Endeavour's main engines will be commanded to shut off and the shuttle will separate from its external fuel tank. Endeavour will settle into an elliptical orbit about 135 statute miles above the Earth at its apogee, which will be refined to a higher orbit above the Earth about 45 minutes into the flight through a firing of the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system engines. Additional rendezvous maneuvers will be executed over the course of the next two days, bringing Endeavour to a docking with the International Space Station on Sunday. Seconds after discarding the external fuel tank, Commander Chris Ferguson will be maneuvering Endeavour so that the video and digital still cameras embedded in the shuttle's umbilical well can capture image of the tank as it falls away. And about a minute and a half after the umbilical well imagery is obtained, mission specialists Stephanie Piper and Pettit will collect handheld imagery of the tank from a distance of about 1,400 feet. All of that will be downlinked for analysis by imagery experts uh, on the ground three and a half hours into the flight. And since the separation will occur in darkness, there's going to be no opportunity to gather handheld video of the tank. Endeavour 7 crew members will go to work shortly after the shuttle's payload bay doors are open, activating systems, unstowing gear, and preparing for their 8-hour sleep period. It's scheduled to begin about 2 a.m. Central Time Saturday night. Again, the ascent team uh, and flight director Brian Lunny is all set to take over control at solid rocket booster ignition of the Civic... 22nd flight of Endeavour, the 27th mission in shuttle program history, and the 31st space shuttle night launch. At T minus nine minutes and holding, this is Mission Control Houston. We're back at Kennedy Space Center now, and all continues to go well. Shortly before the T minus nine minute hold, NASA test director Charlie Blackwell Thompson was being briefed on a small issue with the main engine data transmitting system. A technician was out of sync with the engineer in the firing room on that system. There is no issue with the main engines, and we are not working on any issues that would delay launch at 7.55 p.m. During the T-minus nine-minute hold, several polls will be taken. They'll verify that the team is ready to proceed with launch. At this time, again, there are no concerns. This is UIS. Go ahead. Yes, looking for an update on step 1094 and our gram camera status. Okay, if you're ready for the fill-ins, I'm ready to give them to you. We're all ready to support. Ready for the I'm ready for the fill-ins. Okay, long range north is 8. Long range south is 8. Medium range north, south, and west are all 6. And short range are 6. And I copy on FUIS. And HDD OTC. HDD. Can you verify 1138, 1139? They're in work. Copy. And launch director entity 232. 212, sorry. Launch director Joe. Yes, sir. At this time, I can give you step 1096. Our ground camera system is verified ready to support launch. Copy all. And, sir, if you're ready, we can also work our launch window determination. Okay, we'll work that momentarily. At T minus nine minutes in holding, with a little over 30 minutes left in the hold, we'll go to Allard Butel in the NASA News Center for a hands-on look at NASA's new water recycling system being taken up on Endeavour for the STS-126 mission. Thank you. Thanks, Kendra. Uh, we are here in the NASA News Center, and I'm here with Bob Bagdigian. We are, he's a, a project manager out of the Marshall Space Flight Center who uh, works the International Space Station Life Support Systems. and. Uh, Bob, you're going to walk us through the uh, not only what we have here, the, the oxygen generation system, which is already on board the station, but 
what we bring up on this mission. Uh, that, that's correct. Um, collectively, we refer to this entire three-rack system as a regenerative life support system. As its name implies, we use this to, through regenerative means, provide the crew with all the oxygen and water that they need. The oxygen system is on orbit right now. It was launched on STS-121 in July 2006. Uh, we've been putting it through periodic checkout since that time. Uh, everything's uh, looking good with that system. What the system does, it generates oxygen for the crew to breathe through a process of water electrolysis. It will get its water, ultimately, from the water recovery system. We'll walk down here and take a look at that now. Uh, this is what's flying. This is uh, what's called our water recovery system. It's uh, on the vehicle tonight. Uh, it'll be launched. Um, and during the 126 mission, these two racks will be located out of the MPLM module and installed in the Destiny module and will begin to go through a, 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 a sequence of, per, of checkout procedures to make sure that this system is operating the way it's intended. And there's two racks, they, they each serve a different function. We walk through, how about the first water recovery system rack? Right. Uh, both racks uh, collectively uh, inc uh, include the water recovery system. There's two main parts of that system. A urine processor assembly, which as its name implies, recovers urine through a process of distillation, and a water processor assembly that takes the output from the urine processor and mixes it with all the other wastewater we get from the crew, which is predominantly humidity condensate that comes from the crew's breathing and sweat, and puts that water, combined water through a sequence of treatment processes. And they, what exactly, how does it help us out? How does it filter all this stuff out? Okay, well, let's take it one at a time. Uh, we treat the urine first through our urine processor. Uh, the heart of that processor is shown down here. It goes through what we call a distillation process. It basically turns that urine into steam, which is purified relative to the urine. It's separated from the urine through a, a artificial gravity force that's generated inside this rotating device. Okay. That steam is separated and then is combined with humidity condensate to go through the remainder of the treatment process. That treatment process includes particulate filtration, uh, a sequence of chemical beds that we we call multi-filtration beds and these beds have uh, materials that you can commonly find here on the earth in water purification treatments uh, systems for the home things like activated carbon and ion exchange resins what we've specifically done here is arranged and selected those materials to treat the very unique type of wastewater that we have here um, once the water comes out of the multi-filtration beds, it's, it's very clean, but still not quite clean enough uh, to give to the crew to um, uh, drink. And so we put it through a, a reactor ORU that, treat, that heats that water to a very high temperature in the presence of a catalyst, and we can oxidize any trace organics that are residual in that water. Some final, final polishing beds remove any residual contaminants. We add iodine to the water for, to maintain microbial control during storage. And then the water is stored in tanks and is available to the crew to use uh, whenever they have the need. And the crew typically uses, um, we found on the station, about, about a gallon of water a day per person, that, give or take? That, that's right. Uh, roughly about uh, one gallon a day um, for a crew of six. Obviously, we'll, we'll need to support, uh, need to provide the crew with six gallons a day. Now, there are a number of different ways that the crew can get water on the space station. During the initial operation of this system, uh, we'll, we'll be, uh, as we're checking the system out, this system will, will be giving the crew about two of those six gallons. It has a higher capacity, so the program will have flexibility once this is checked out to uh, put more reliance on this system for supplying that water. And, and obviously this is just our initial steps at, at this regenerative life support systems. This is our first you know, way of, of turning sweat and, and urine and wastewater into usable water because we obviously can't take water runs to uh, when we're on trips to the moon and on the farther away places like that, Mars. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. For, for the International Space Station that's in uh, low Earth orbit, uh, obviously costly to get material uh, to the space station. Um, this system with the performance efficiency we have in this system uh, can support the space station uh, very well. But as we look ahead towards going to the moon and then to Mars, uh, we understand that the, the efficiency that we expect to achieve in this system we're going to have to do even better on. And by getting this system up and operational on the space station is going to give us a very important opportunity to uh, gain 
long-term operational experience with systems like this so we know where to target our future improvements for exploration beyond low Earth orbit. And that's the idea that the International Space Station is a test bed for these exact kind of hardware procedures and, and they start up being refrigerator size and the idea is that future versions should be smaller, more compact, easier to use. That's right, we're always looking for ways to improve uh, uh, weight and volume, all, always at a premium power. Uh, reliability, especially when you're talking about a life support system, is, is, is high up on the list. And by running this kind of system for a long period of time, we'll get a, a lot of important knowledge about what things tend to wear out sooner than others and where we need to apply some, some engineering and technology development resources. On the crew plans to take uh, samples that have already been provided by the uh, International Space Station crew members and they will uh, run it through the system? That's correct. Uh, they're, they're, uh, the space station crew has already set aside, has collected and set aside some urine. Uh, that urine will, will serve as the initial testing fluid for this system. Once the system is installed on orbit during this mission, uh, it'll be activated. The, uh, we're very anxious to go ahead and get this system up and running during this mission so that the crew can collect some water samples, get them back to the ground on this mission, and we can begin gathering that that data that we're going to need to uh, finally declare uh, next springtime that this system is is operational and ready to support six crew. Right, it'll take about 90 days or so and, and test the water. And, right. Well, one of the other things that beyond the obvious is, is well, let's face it, we're talking about turning old water into new water, and, and we, you guys refer to it as the ick factor. And, and I'll be perfectly honest, that even people, not just media that we have here, but uh, members of, of, of NASA, when they heard uh, I was going to sample some of the water, <laughs> I got it, are you kidding? You're seriously going to do that? And, and that's the psychological thing you have to overcome. Sure, and, it, and we, we fully expected that uh, back in the earliest days when we, when we were going about the, the, the conceiving a system like this. We, we got to the point where we had selected our technologies and tested it, and we knew we could put a whole bunch of laboratory data on the table with numbers that showing that the water is clean and safe, but we always knew that it was going to be that subjective ick factor that was going to have to be overcome. So we, we actually went through tests with subjects and, and gave them blind samples of our water compared to similarly treated tap water and asked them to rate it. And we could never find any uh, statistical meaningful difference in, in uh, the, the rating of that water right. compared to other water. Well, and it doesn't actually, and I'll, I'll say this is a sample that you guys have collected from the fine folks at the Marshall Space Flight Center. Yeah, yeah, some of me is in there, I think. Well, I really <laughs> didn't need to know that. Um, it doesn't actually help when you have on the bottle, it says we use only the finest ingredients, urine, perspiration, food vapors, bath water, uh, simulated animal waste, and a touch of iodine. Yeah, every, everything it's, everything we could throw at it, we, we threw at it, and, uh, and there it is, there's, there's the product. There it is, a little bit of you, and that's great. Well, <laughs> with uh, no disrespect to Mr. Armstrong, I'm. Uh, this is one small sip for me and one giant leap of faith for my mind. Cheers. Actually, it, it, I, it doesn't taste any worse than the bottled water that I... Uh, that I had it the rest of the day, although a little bit of you in there probably was more than I needed to know, and that's <laughs> but, but it really wasn't that bad. And and, and I, if it can produce that for the for the crew and save water, save money, and uh, that's a good thing. Abs absolutely, we're very excited. Uh, looking forward to this uh, having a long, useful life on station. Excellent, Bob. Bob Agdicki, and thank you very much for joining us. And we're going to actually much. go back now to the uh, Launch Control Center and Kendra Thomas for uh, uh, the rest of the countdown and uh, good start to a good mission, Kendra. This is Shuttle Launch Control at T minus nine minutes in holding. This time we've uh, lost our uh, IRAMs, our inertial reference alignment monitor system uh, here at KSC. Um, it's not a constraint to continuing the count. We are back up to JSC and we have confirmed that their system is up and running. Uh, but I was advised that we should report this uh, to the team uh, and take paper. And SD, NTD? SD's looking on 212. Did you copy? CGNC's report on IRAMs? I do. I copy the report that uh, KSC IRAMs is uh, currently not available and that uh, JSC IRAMs is up and running and JSC IRAMs is a primary backup for a GNC64 problem. We will need to uh, probably talk to the LPS folks and uh, if they think they had an LPS problem, I think it might have been related to our GMT rollover. We'll need to pick up some paper and go document that occurrence and go investigate that after countdown. And let's see, uh, is that integrated paper or LPS paper? You know, that is not uh, first-line GSE, not directly connected to the vehicle. Um, I think uh, maybe uh, GNC can spit some, shed some light on what they think might have actually happened, but it, it sounded like it might have been a, an LPS or software-related problem. This is GNC. It is a software-related problem. It was uh, basically triggered by the uh, rollover of the day. 
only thing my recommendation would be to uh, allow the LPS guys to uh, to go document it, and uh, and no constraint to launch countdown. And let's see, uh, CGNC, I copy uh, your recommendation and your go for launch in this configuration, correct? That's fair. And SB, you uh, concur with this recommendation? SB concurs. And let's see, LPS entity. Entity LPS. Yes, uh, do you have anything to add on this issue? Uh, negative, that's what we believe, uh, that it occurred at it rollover, and uh, we'll open paper on it. Now, P.S., I copy, and you'll open up your uh, your paper on that. That's for me. And Houston Flight Entity? Entity, go ahead. Yes, sir, just wanted to make sure that you copied that our IRAMS is uh, is down. Uh, we did copy, we understand, and uh, ours is running just fine, so we're go. And I copy all. All sections M&O, uh, sequence 179, verify. We're at T-minus nine minutes and holding, with a little uh, more than 25 minutes left in the, the planned hold. I'm here with Assistant Launch Director Pete Nikolinko. Pete, thanks so much for joining me. No problem, Kendra. Could you tell me a little bit about uh, how the count's been going? Well, this countdown has been exceptionally clean and smooth. Uh, we have had no technical issues. The vehicle has been very clean. The uh, countdown has been proceeding right on the timeline. All the activities are right on the mark, and that's the way we like it. Uh, the weather's been cooperating, and we're looking forward to launch here within the hour. Now, we had a little bit of a weather concern earlier in the week, but it's been proved, hasn't it? Uh, thankfully, it has. Uh, the weather models have held just like they have uh, predicted, and right now all the weather criteria are, are go, which is good for us. Excellent. Um, so we're planning on launching at 7.55 p.m.? That is correct. Uh, we had the final launch window uh, update uh, with the flight director and launch director just a few minutes ago, and we've selected the preferred launch time, which is uh, 7.55.39 uh, Eastern, so within the hour. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule and letting us know how things are going. My pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. NTD to CDSS. Ed? Yeah, I was wondering if you had a, um, a hard line for the closeout crew, um, a hard line where they fall back to. Uh, stand by, I'll get them on the radio. At T minus nine minutes in holding, we have 23 minutes left in this planned built in hold. In the next few minutes, NASA Test Director Charlie Blackwell Thompson, Mission Management Team Chairman Leroy Kane, and Launch Director Mike Leinbach will complete polls, verifying that everyone's ready to pick up with the countdown. The launch team's not currently working any issues that would delay launch tonight at 7.55 p.m. here from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida.
at T minus nine minutes and holding. This is shuttle launch control. CGSS OTC. Go ahead, CGSS. What's, what's your hard line? OTC, PVD. PVD, go. Yeah, step 1119 is not performed. I can verify 1120, 1121, and payload base purge flow rate is set for launch.
NTD to CGSS. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, we um, we're looking at our white room camera, and uh, I just got in touch with the closed out crew. Um, seems it uh, looks like they didn't attach a, a hold back latch that holds the uh, the door open on the LAA. The, uh, there's a swing door that swings open and holds it against the wall, and uh, nobody in the closed out crew could uh, verify that they put in the quick release pin to hold it back. And, uh, and we're looking now, we can't tell too m It doesn't look like it by the camera, but it's uh, blowing around a little bit. So uh, we're thinking that they didn't put that pin in. So uh, I don't know if, if there's enough time. I'm not sure how much time is left in the hold. If you might be able to either expedite them up there or just, uh, just let you know that that's not attached at this point in time. And CGSS, I have 16 minutes left in the hold. Is this a constraint to launch? We have no um, hard constraints, but um, but the door is just going to be it's going to be flopping around. And uh, NSP entity. NSP is with you. But let's see. A question for you guys: um, How is the door actually constrained from from moving right now? And when we go through OAA retraction? And thinking about the possibility of re-extension, what's your thought on on how the door is actually going to move and, and handle that part? And SPE and CGSS, if I could have you go to 161 to discuss this. SP copy. 161.
This is shuttle launch control at T minus nine minutes and holding. Launch director Mike Leinbach and the rest of the team are discussing a potential issue with an inner white room door. The issue is whether or not the door has been pinned back and secured. The situation is currently being evaluated. We'll have more information just as soon as we can. CISL, JRPS, and Houston Flight perform L-15 recorder activation. CISL, you copy? ISL copies. RPS copy. And Houston Flight? And Houston Flight Entity. Entity, Houston Flight. Yes, did you copy? Perform your L-15 recorder activation. We'll put it in work. And MS-1026. MS-1? Activate D-10 recorder. D-10 recorder in work. Go. And attention on the net, this is the entity performing the launch status check. Verify ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC. OTC is go. TBC. TBC is go. TTC. TTC is go. LPS. LPS is go. Houston Flight. Houston Flight is go. Myla. Myla is a go. STM. STM is go. Safety. Safety console is go. SPE. SP is no go at this time. LRD. LRD is go. SRO. SRO is go. You have range clear to launch. And CDR. CDR is go. And I copy CDR. And HCDOTC.
HCD or TC or the ground. This LRD was you, was it Rock calling me? HCD, can you verify 1138? I can verify. Thanks. SP two and two. Go ahead, SP. Yes, ma'am. We've got some words from CGSS on the white room configuration for you. And I'm ready. All right, into you, CGSS. Um, yeah, we looked at it. Um, we did verify that uh, the pin is not installed, so the door is um, loose. Um, there is a handrail out of the out the uh, outboard side, so the door, uh, in a worst case scenario, um, would uh, not be. It's not going to be able to. Uh, swing all the way out and contact the orbiter. Um, there's a physical handrail that's going to stop it. Um, at this point in time, we're just um, just going to um, looking at the fact that we're going to sustain a little bit of damage and uh, and just deal with that. And uh, we're ready to support. And uh, just uh, we just like you to brief the crew that um, if there's a possibility that they have to get out. That they, um, they're just going to have to deal with that. Um, the hatch. It's no interference with the hatch opening or anything like that, but it's just um, it's going to be flopping around in there. We're just going to have to push it out of their way. And no issues with the hatch opening, is that correct? That is correct. And your recommendation uh, is go for launch in this configuration? That's correct. CJS launch director? Go ahead. Yeah, would you characterize the vibration that we can expect on that door as the vehicle is descending? Uh, well, obviously, it doesn't reach its max until the, until the main engines and the SRB pass by. But early in ascent, when it might become a debris hazard, what what kind of vibration levels are you talking in there? Well, there's there's an there's enough vibration as it as it passes to break the the lights inside the white room. Um, it bounces around. A bit, but um, we don't think that anything is going to um, fatigue or break off or anything. Um, we don't think it's it, it's going to bounce around that bad to where it's going to break the door off or anything to that. Right. Matter. No, I don't think so either. The worst vibrations are as the SRBs pass by. So, okay, copy. NTDSB. Go ahead. Hey, Charlie. From my perspective, two things we're going to need to go do. Number one, we will watch the uh, OA configuration during retraction, and uh, and and I think we shall be watching that. If it does exactly what we think it's going to do, even if the door swings open and contacts the rail, that's the configuration that, that we would expect it to be in. A little word you need to pass the crew that that could be the expected configuration if, in fact, they have to reopen the hatch and after we've re-extended the orbit access on. And I copy that, SP. And SPE, do you concur with CGSS's recommendation of go for launch in this configuration? I do concur. I am go for launch in this configuration. And CDR entity, T12? Uh, CDR copies all, and uh, we understand, and we're go. And I copy. And SPE entity, verify, ready to resume count, and go for launch. Yes, go. And launch director entity. Launch director. Yes, sir. Step 1124, our launch team is ready to proceed. Okay, I copy that. I'll do my poll at this time. KSC Chief Processing Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. No constraints. Thanks, Steve. KSC Safety and Mission Assurance. KSC Safety and Mission Assurance is go. Copy. Payload Launch Manager. Payload to go, Mike. Thank you, Gennaro. Range weather. Weather has no constraints to launch. Thank you, Kathy. And Ops Manager. See launch director, ops manager on 212, Mike. The MMP is not working any issues. You are go to launch. Okay, thank you, sir. Endeavor launch director. Yeah, go ahead, Mike. Okay, Fergie, vehicle's in good shape. The weather's beautiful. And so on behalf of the entire shuttle launch team, good luck, Godspeed, and have a happy Thanksgiving on orbit. Kudos to your team, Mike. It's uh, our turn to take uh, home improvement to a new level uh, after 10 years of international space station construction. Endeavors ready to go. Copy that. Thank you, sir. And to do with that, you are clear to proceed. I copy that. And attention on the net, we have 14 seconds left in our remaining hold here at 9. And NTD ISO. Countdown clock will resume on my mark. 3, 2, 1, mark. T minus 9 minutes and counting. TLS auto sequence has been initiated. CISL, go ahead. Recorder activation complete. Copy all.
This is shuttle launch control at T minus eight minutes, 38 seconds and counting. The launch team verified that the inner door of the white room was not secured, but it's not a concern for launch. The crew has been briefed, all poles have been taken, and we are go for launch at 7.55 p.m. Eastern Time here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. TLT OTC, connect essential buses to the fuel route. TLT is in work. An Endeavour OTC had the great flight delivering Leonardo to the space station. The legacy of his discoveries rise with you as you continue the quest for knowledge. Godspeed. Endeavour copies all. Thanks, OTC. The orbiter access arm has now been retracted away from Endeavour. It's the walkway used by the crew to enter the shuttle and can be returned to the position within seconds if necessary. T-minus six minutes, nine seconds and counting. We've received notification from Mission Control in Houston to start the orbiter flight recorders. The two recorders collect measurements of shuttle system's performance during the flight for playback after the vehicle is in orbit. OTC, PLT-3, great talk back. Copy all. TLS is go for orbiter, APU start. TLT, OTC, perform APU start. TLT is in work. CDR, OTC, reconfigure heaters. We have a go for APU start. The launch team has terminated liquid oxygen replenished to the external tank. It is now initiating LOX drain back. T-minus three minutes, 50 seconds, and counting. The engines are being gimbaled into position for launch.
PLS is go for ET LO2 pressurization. PLT OTC clear, caution and warning, memory, verify no unexpected errors. OTC PLT, no unexpected errors. T minus two minutes, 24 seconds and counting. The gaseous oxygen vent hood is slowly being retracted away from the top of the external tank. Endeavor OTC, close and lock your visors and initiate O2 flow. That is in work. T minus two minutes and counting. PLS is go for ET LH2 pressurization. Liquid hydrogen replenish on the external tank is now being terminated. T minus one minute, 30 seconds. All systems are go. We're about 90 seconds from launch of Space Shuttle Endeavor. T minus one minute and counting. Auto sequence start. T minus 26 seconds, we have auto sequence set. 20, 15, 10. TLS is go for main engine start. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of Space Shuttle Endeavour, preparing our home in space for a larger international family. Houston now controlling. Houston Endeavour, roll program. Roger, roll Endeavour. Commander Chris Ferguson confirming Endeavour is rolling on course for a rendezvous with the International Space Station. Feet a thousand miles an hour. Altitude one mile, downrange distance six and a half miles from Kennedy Space Center already. Three engines throttling down to 72% of the rated thrust as the shuttle goes through the realm of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Altitude five miles, downrange eight miles from Kennedy Space Center. Speed 1,500 miles an hour. Endeavor, go at throttle up. All systems remain go. Speed 2,000 miles an hour, altitude 10 miles, downrange distance 12 miles from Kennedy Space Center. It's one and a half minutes since launch. Endeavour has consumed more than two and a quarter million pounds of propellant and weighs less than half of what it did at launch. Standing by for burnout of the twin solid rocket boosters and jettison.
Boostrofts confirms a clean separation of the two solid rockets. Endeavour's three main engines continuing the second stage, accelerating with 37 million horsepower. Endeavour's two orbital maneuvering system engines firing now to help boost the shuttle into orbit. They'll fire for a one minute and 36 seconds. Altitude 440 miles. Two engine tail. Two engine tail. That call means Endeavour can perform a transatlantic landing at, Mar at Zergos of Spain if required. Speed 4,000 miles now. Altitude 44 miles. 73 miles from Kennedy Space Center. Three minutes, 30 seconds into Endeavour's flight. Speed 4,900 miles an hour, altitude 53 miles. Downrange 115 miles from Kennedy Space Center. Three good auxiliary power units, three good fuel cells, three good shuttle main engines. Endeavour, negative return. Return. That call indicates Endeavour is going too fast now to return to Kennedy Space Center for a landing if a problem should arise. Just under four minutes to the main engine cutoff. During that time, Endeavour is going to triple its speed to reach the 17,400 miles an hour needed to reach Earth orbit. Current speed, 6,000 miles an hour. Altitude, 62 miles. Three good engines, three good auxiliary power units, three good fuel cells. Watching live television pictures from a camera mounted on the external tank of Endeavour. Altitude 66 miles, downrange 245 miles from Kennedy Space Center. Speed 7,300 miles an hour. Endeavour, press to ATO. Press to ATO. Endeavour could now reach a lower than planned orbit, but a safe orbit on just two engines. Speed 8,000 miles an hour, 11,000 feet per second, altitude 67 miles, 300 miles east of Kennedy Space Center. Endeavour, single engine Ops 3. Single engine Ops 3. Endeavour could now perform a transatlantic landing on only one engine at 109 percent of rated thrust if required. Everything going well. Endeavour rolling to a heads up position now to assist its performance and communication links as it climbs to orbit. Single engine Zaragoza 104. Single engine Zaragoza 104. Endeavour, press to Miko. Endeavour traveling 10,000 miles an hour, and the shuttle could reach its planned orbit on just two engines if necessary. Just under two minutes to main engine cutoff now. Altitude 66 miles. Endeavour, your shutdown plan is nominal. Go for the plus X. Shutdown plan nominal. Go for the plus X. Commander Chris Ferguson uh, getting the go-ahead for the plus X maneuver in which he will manually raise Endeavour's nose into a plus X position to allow handheld photography of the external tank using digital cameras on the... Endeavour, single engine press, 104. Single engine press, 104.
Speed now 13,000 miles an hour. Downrange 590 miles. Altitude 64 miles. Three good main engines. Three good auxiliary power units. Three good fuel cells. Endeavour's communication signals now being processed through the tracking and data relay satellite system. Speed 16,000 miles an hour, altitude 64 miles, downrange 760 miles. Booster officer confirms main engine cutoff, standing by for jettison of the external tank. Receiving live television pictures as Endeavour falls away from the external tank. Continuous climb to orbit. Speed 17,400 miles an hour, altitude 67 miles, downrange distance 1,000 miles. Endeavour Houston, we saw a nominal MECO, OMS-1 is not required. Copy, nominal MECO, OMS-1 not required. Capcom Allen Poindexter pointing out there's no reason to uh, use the shuttle's orbital maneuvering system for the uh, first boost to help it reach a proper orbit. Endeavour Houston, 
Got uh, just one delta for you on page 3-4. Uh, we're ready to copy. Tail only control is not required. Everything else as written, and we'll take 105 when you get there. Copy. Tail only control not required, otherwise as written, and you're go for 105. Good read back, Fergie. Endeavor Houston for BIM, we see that uh, MPS TVC ISIL valves 1 and 3 are closed, and I think you just got 2. That's correct. I did them uh, order 1, 3, 2. Thanks, BIM. Your go for APU hide shutdown. Copy. Go for APU hide shutdown. Endeavor uh, Houston. Preliminary ohms two TIG is three eight colon one five. Okay, we copy Dex uh, three eight colon one five. Good read back, Fergie. This is Mission Control Houston as Flight Director Brian Lunny and his team here on the Ascent uh, Control Team of the Space Shuttle Endeavors mission uh, continue to go through their post-insertion timeline after the uh, launch of Endeavor today. All systems looking good. Space Shuttle now heading out over the uh, northern Atlantic. We're about 22 minutes from the uh, next planned event on orbit. Uh, that's when the crew will fire the Space Shuttle's orbital maneuvering system engines uh, to uh, circularize the orbit. There was initial orbit about 135 miles high. This uh, first orbital maneuvering system burn will take it up to an altitude of 141 miles at its uh, highest and 97 miles at its lowest. Again, Endeavour on its way to a link up at an altitude of 212 statute miles with the International Space Station on Sunday.
And Debra Houston, spreading in 15 seconds, we'll be able, unable to talk to you for about two minutes. Uh, we copy all. Thanks, Dex. And Alan Poindexter relaying to uh, Chris Ferguson the word that they're going to begin spreading uh, into a broader spectrum, the communications channels to avoid uh, interfering with communications over Europe as the space shuttle prepares to pass over that uh, continent on an easterly direction. Eighteen minutes and thirty seconds since the launch of the shuttle from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. All systems uh, work very well during climb to orbit. And we're now 20 minutes away from the upcoming orbital maneuvering system burn called OMS-2 that will begin to circularize the orbit as uh, Endeavour continues to make its way toward the International Space Station. Commander Chris Ferguson, Pilot Eric Bowe, and uh, Mission Specialist Steve Bowen, Don Pettit, Heidi Stephanie Piper, Shane Kimbrough, and uh, upcoming Space Station crew member Sandy Magnus, uh, continue to go through their post-insertion uh, activities, uh, enjoying uh, their first uh, feelings of uh, microgravity on orbit, getting the shuttle uh, squared away following launch and uh, getting ready for its use as an orbital vehicle. Tim, we'll be ready for those on time. Endeavor, Houston, we like the targets. Your go to load. And copy targets are good, and we'll go to load.
Intercom check on lightweight headset. We have you loud and clear, Fergie. We got you the same. We're ready for it. Thanks, ma'am. This is Mission Control Houston. Uh, pilot uh, Eric Bull reporting that he's about to begin closing the umbilical door that uh, was uh, used to allow fuel to flow through uh, the external tank and uh, Space Shuttle Endeavour into its three main engines for the climb to orbit. About 13 minutes from our uh, next event on orbit, which will be an orbital maneuvering system burn to begin circularizing the orbit of the shuttle. And to continue it on track for a rendezvous with the International Space Station on Sunday. As soon as the crew is uh, complete with its post-insertion timeline, uh, pilot Eric Bowe and uh, Shane Kimbrough, mission specialists, will begin limbering up the space shuttle's robotic arm, uh, powering it up and getting it ready for the inspections that will follow on the way to the International Space Station to ensure that the shuttle's heat protection systems are in good working order and it's ready for a landing at the conclusion of the mission. Steve Bowen and Sandy Magnus will begin setting up communications equipment on board the station. And Don Pettit and Shane Kimrow will begin working with the setup of the uh, laptop computer network that will be used for the various tasks planned on this uh, mission. And this is a mission of extreme home improvements. The Space Shuttle Endeavour crew bringing uh, supplies and equipment to the International Space Station, including among those uh, equipment and supplies will be needed to turn the space station into a uh, five-bedroom, two-bath house with a kitchen and support uh, six residents on a continuing basis. Flight also uh, has four spacewalks planned that will be used to service the uh, solar alpha rotary joints that allow the station's photovoltaic cells to rotate and track the sun, providing electricity for all the activities going on inside. Houston, uh, while Ben's working the doors, can we give you the maneuver? Endeavor Houston, we're ready for the maneuver. Capcom Allen Poindexter uh, agreeing that uh, the team here on the ground uh, as the crew on the shuttle is uh, ready to maneuver the shuttle into the proper orientation for the upcoming orbital maneuvering system adjust.
Houston, we're headed to the card for the Ohms 2 burn. We copy, Endeavor, we're watching. This is Mission Control Houston as we continue to watch these replays of Endeavour's launch at uh, 6.55 p.m. Central Time from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We're now two minutes away from the upcoming maneuver using the orbital maneuvering system engines to uh, continue Endeavour's climb to orbit. Good config for the burn. Copy, good config for the burn. Alan Poindexter relaying up to Commander Chris Ferguson that the uh, propulsion systems officer here in Mission Control sees a good configuration for this burn of the orbital maneuvering system engines. The two engines will fire for about one minute and three seconds to increase the speed of the shuttle by about 65 miles an hour and begin to circularize its orbit at an altitude of 141 by 97 miles. Shuttle currently orbiting over the uh, eastern coast of Africa as it begins a subtly course over the Indian Ocean. Now 37 minutes into the flight of Endeavour to the International Space Station on a home improvement mission. Bringing recycling equipment that will help uh, Minimize the amount of water that needs to be launched to the International Space Station and permit uh, long-term operations by six-person crews. A second toilet, uh, another kitchen, and two sets of private crew quarters.
all that equipment pack into the Leonardo multi-purpose logistics module, which is tucked away in Endeavour's payload bay. Five seconds to the orbital maneuvering system burn. Propulsion systems officer confirms that two good orbital maneuvering system engines burning in this uh, slightly longer than one minute burn that will continue the rendezvous plan with the International Space Station.